All right. Hello, everybody. You have a little break there. Uh, hi, my name is Ellen Danford. I am a recently graduated master's student from The Ohio State University, and I'm here to work with Dr. Tanya Zaviezo, who is at La Catolica um, here on the San Joaquin campus. So I will be working with establishing a parasitoid master's ridden with the help of some native Chilean plants. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Okay, so a little bit, I was going to do some academic background here with some fun pictures thrown in. That's kind of the trend today. Um, I did my undergraduate at Western Kentucky University. I'm from Kentucky, so that was a nice in-state school. And I was looking at trees and carbon sequestration in an urban forest, which I had an excellent time with doing that. Um, and then in grad school, I jumped into the entomology world, which is where my current project is located, um, and was looking at socioeconomic conditions as well as landscape features that were affecting our insect communities in urban areas. So we did a lot of looking at using native plants to enhance our insect communities, which all kind of led me into my current project of establishing a parasitoid wasp with native plants in apple orchards. So I got to bring back the trees and all of the entomology stuff. So assuming that most of you probably aren't entomologists, I'm now going to tell you what biocontrol is and what parasitoids are, because those are not words that most people usually use. Um, starting a little basic with invasive species, um, these are non-native species that are brought to an area generally through shipping patterns, which multiply aggressively without natural enemies, and these generally have a negative effect on our native communities, whether it be plant or insect, they generally, or nematode or smaller, they generally have negative effects on our native communities. So a couple examples here, this is the multicolored Asian lady beetle, Harmonia axoritis, if you've ever had a ladybug infestation, that was that ladybug. Uh, the emerald ash borer you're probably familiar with if you're from the US. This is an imported beetle that came in probably through lumber or um, different shipping pallets, but has almost decimated the ash in Northern America. Um, if you've ever been to the South, kudzu is pretty much everywhere. It was imported to help with erosion and then took over everything. It was not the best idea. <laughs> so we have a lot of invasive species. Um, the species that I'm looking at is Cydia pominella. It is a lepidopteran, which just means a moth or a butterfly, but this is a moth. Um, and it's called the codling moth. So it's one of the most effective agricultural pests out of all of them, which is incredible. <laughs> and it can be found in almost every country in the whole globe where apples are grown, which is quite a few of them in our temperate regions, um, including the US and also Chile. And what's interesting about this pest is that it's very, very effective. When you have an infested orchard, it causes 30 to 50% of yield loss. So this doesn't mean that your fruit doesn't grow. It just means that you can't sell the fruit that you have because it looks like this. So this moth lays larvae, little eggs, on the apple, and then the larvae burrow into the inside of the apple, leaving these it's actually frost marks, which means poop, on the outside of the apple. And then generally, if you were to bite into this apple, you would probably find a worm inside, which is unpleasant. So when you have this kind of fruit, it's unsellable. Um, and just for some agricultural context, generally speaking, a large grower is able to tolerate about 1% like yield loss. So 30 to 50% yield loss would make an entire economic loss for a year. So this is a pretty big deal. And unfortunately, it reproduces really, really well. So during a growing season, you'll have um, little larvae that have overwintered in the bark of your tree, which when it starts getting warm, will pupate, turn into adult moths, lay eggs on your apples, and then those larvae burrow into the apples, grow up a little bit, and then pupate and do it again. And they can repeat this cycle three times a season. So this means a couple things. First of all, if you have some codling moths, you have a lot of codling moths already. And second of all, because it repeats multiple times a season, if you want to use pesticides to control the codling moth, you have to have distinct applications for each generation. So you have to know when they're going to reproduce and where to spray because they can burrow into tree bark, but they can also burrow into the ground or into leaf litter. They're unfortunately incredibly versatile. So a couple things people have tried to do is to net individual pieces of fruit, which as you can imagine, takes a really long time. Um, we've also tried netting whole orchards, which is semi-effective, but not at all cost effective, not particularly efficient, and it keeps out other natural enemies. So you tend to get different types of pests. So not terribly effective. Um, in the world of chemical pesticides, these are typically the most three recommended. 
We know pesticides are helpful. They can help us take care of pests. I'm not here to say that we should never use pesticides, but there are a lot of downsides. So if you don't know, um, apples do have a flower and they are pollinated by bees. Um, and all three of these pesticides have negative effect on bees. So depending on how your overlap happens with those codling moth generations, you might also be killing off your um, pollinators when you're applying these different types of pesticides. They also all on the safety data sheet say that they're toxic to aquatic ecosystems in general, which is very broad. So it's not the best scenario. So what we're focusing on is classical biocontrol. So we're taking specifically an insect agent, a natural enemy, um, from Kazakhstan, where apples are originally from, and also the codling moth. And we're gonna bring it here to control uh, the codling moth. So the general life cycle here is that you have your adult wasp, and they actually lay eggs inside the larvae of different types of moths. The eggs hatch and grow up inside the larvae, and they eat the moth larvae, and then they emerge as beautiful wasps, ready to start the cycle again. It is a little bit gross, but it is a very, very effective form of control. <laughs> Um, so our specific wasp is he's really cute. He's uh, probably smaller than your pinky nail for a size reference here. Um, his name is Master Shriddens. Um, it's an ichnomoid wasp and it's a specialist. And this guy is great because he actively seeks Cidiopomonella or the codling moth via pheromones. So this is about as specific as it gets. They can disperse from their release point, meaning that once you release it in an orchard, it could theoretically, if fed well, it could cover that whole orchard. and key note here, they can also produce several generations a year. So this moth or this wasp can help follow the trends of your moth and give you pest control for the whole year. Which sounds pretty great. Um, and just for reference, this is importation biocontrol. So apples and the codling moth and the wasp are all from Kazakhstan and we're bringing them to Chile. And people usually tend to ask me, well, how is that safe? Like, do you know that this is going to work? You have to do a lot of testing before you're allowed to release new insects in a country intentionally. So we do choice and no choice testing, which means you give them the choice between two different types of moths, larvae, and see what they pick. But you also starve the wasp and then see if it will pick a different type of larvae, just to make sure that if they can't find the codling moth, they won't gregariously attack other things that are interested. So we did successfully get a release permit. It is safe as far as we know. Um, it's also very effective. The problem is that Masters Ridden's adults need nectar to survive. So this is a bee, not a wasp, forgive me, I'm sorry. But they need the nectar out of flowers to reproduce and lay eggs. Unfortunately, there's not widely available flowers in apple orchards for most of the season. And our starved females are living shorter lives, they have less eggs and they disperse less efficiently. And my collaborator has released Masters Ridden's and they see a huge decrease in codling moth in orchards, but then they never find it again. It's not establishing, it's not finding enough nectar resources to make generations that continue. So our goal here is to support Masters Riddens and apple orchards using native Chilean flower strips to give them some nectar resources. And we're really, really hoping that planting these flower strips will let the, the wasp establish and take over and just continue to live in these apple orchards and provide continual pest control. Um, so we have a couple research sites in the O'Higgins region, which is south of here, um, if you don't know where that is yet. Um, and we're also doing a study site at Pirque, which is one of La Catolica's extension centers. So it's kind of a, an exhibition, hopefully, <laughs> if it works. Um, so we've got a couple steps here. First step is to design native flower strips that Masters Riddens will use. As it turns out, they've been doing this in the lab for the past like, year or so. Uh, Masters Riddens has a very large head, which means that flowers that have a small like little tiny stem, they can't actually get to the nectar sac. So we're actually having some conversations about finding really large open flowers where they can get to the nectar um, and still working on designing that native flower strip. We're also attempting to not provide extra resources to the codling moth. So we're trying to use flowers that are not at all attractive to the moth so that they don't gain anything extra. Um, I put this up in the corner. Step one and a half, it kind of happens during everything, is we're rearing masters right in the lab. So we have an established colony already, but just continuing to rear more wasps. If you have questions about how that works, come find me later, I'll let you know. Um, and then hopefully soon, we'll be planting these strips in our orchards. So we're not gonna plant them between rows of trees because that really just gets in the way of our farmers and we didn't want to be inconvenient. Um, and there's also sometimes questions about soil depth and running into roots and that sort of thing. So they'll be on the perimeters of the orchards. Um, and we have some interesting smaller questions about, oh, how far are they going to disperse? How are they going to stay by the flowers? Lots of side questions that I won't get into right now. 
Um, and then hopefully we'll be releasing mastrous riddens in the form of parasitized codling moth larvae. So they will be on their way to dying soon and the mastrous riddens will emerge hopefully as lovely wasps. Um, and then a little bit after that, we will assess our success through sentinel prey and artificial nesting material. So our sentinel prey here is a little codling moth larvae that's not parasitized yet. And they're in little mesh cups um, because birds also like to eat them and we would not prefer that. Um, and they, the codling moth cannot get out, even if it turns into a full adult, it won't be able to escape. Um, but our wasp is really tiny, it, it can get in. So when we bring the cups in, we hope to see that it's been parasitized by wasps that we released. Um, we'll also put out little cardboard strips that you wrap around the tree um, because that mimics tree bark. And so we can see if we've got different larvae that are inside the cardboard, kind of to assess like, okay, is a codling moth reproducing? What are our levels here? Um, so there are two different methods of assessing success. Um, and after my departure from Tilly, they will continue to do this. And hopefully we'll see a generational continuance of this. So what we would hope to see is that after a couple years, we'd still have parasitized larvae and we would still have decreased amounts of codling moth larvae here in our cardboard strips, hopefully. So a couple of broader implications. We don't really know what the results will be yet. So these are kind of theoretical, but we already know actually that emeritans can be an effective biocontrol agent. Worldwide is still the question. It's only been released in five countries, if you, yeah, five countries. So that's New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, Chile, and it's sort of in the US, although not widely used, which I'm hoping to help with when I get back. Um, and we hope that native floral strips can help specifically mastrous riddens, but we already know that they can help our other natural enemies in orchards. So you have a lot of things like cosinellids or beetles that tend to eat a lot of really annoying pests in apple orchards and other areas. Um, and we've also got spiders are a great agent of biocontrol and having a refuge in your agricultural places that a lot of different plants can be incredibly helpful. So we already know that and we hope that it'll also help mastrous riddens. Uh, the big deal in Chile is that fruit is a major export um, and we're really hoping that it could benefit from these biocontrol strategies. It could reduce pesticide use, which would be cost effective and also helpful for planet and personal health. Um, but also this could be a really nice, effective and natural way to control our pest. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank again Fulbright for granting this grant um, and also La Catolica and Tanya. And I'd love to take any questions that you guys have.